Hey, all right. So um, I'm thrilled to be here today. And when my friend Mary, who I've known forever, when she called me, it took me like three seconds to say yes. Um, I've come to this incredible leadership symposium some years back. I met some amazing NGOs and, and social entrepreneurs. And so when she said that the subject was storytelling, I said, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to create something just for you. So I did. So I want you to be kind, because this is the first time I've taken this out there. And here's what I'm bringing to you. So um, I want to stimulate your thinking on storytelling. I, wanna, I will say like why storytelling is important, but more so, how do you do it? And how do you do it when you don't have a lot of money? How do you do it maybe you entice an agency to help you out? Um, how do you do it when you might have an intern or somebody to help you? I'm going to give you different types. I'm going to show you great examples. And then at the end, um, I'm going to mention something that I worked on that is that's available on the internet, and it's going to help you also with some of the video production that you do. So why don't we get started? I got it. Barely. <laughs> OK. All right. So all right. Um, how many of you are familiar with the Bat Kid story? Yeah, okay, lots of you, okay. So I'm going to start, I'm going to, at the beginning, I'm going to have something that's a real stretch. And at the end of this, I'm going to have something that's a real stretch. And in between, I just want you to see yourself in there. I want to make sure I see pencils and pens or iPads or something, taking notes, because when you get that spark in your idea of how you can build off these ideas. So let's just talk about Bat Kid. Bat Kid was created by the San Francisco chapter of Make-A-Wish. And as well, there was a group of girls called the Clever Girl Collaborative, a really small firm who said, you know, if we add social media to this, not only can we really make this big, but we can also help to build our brand. And so let's take a look at Bat Kid. My name is Greg Sir. I am the chief of police for the San Francisco Police Department, and this is my city. My sworn duty as chief of police is to do the right thing. Not some of the time, not part of the time, all of the time. And today, the right thing to do is to call Batman. I'm betting my chief star on it. With live breaking news. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ahmed Dates. We begin this morning's broadcast with breaking news from San Francisco's Hall of Justice. Police Chief Greg Sir called an impromptu press conference where he issued a very urgent message. Gotham City needs you, Batman. This is Police Chief Greg Sir, only hoping you can hear my voice. It's critical that you call me right now. We have a damsel in distress. But that's just the beginning, Batman. Just the tip of the iceberg. You have to call me. It's urgent. Please, Cape Crusader. We need you. And bring the bad kid. This was Miles' day. Everything he did, we did together. Good job, bad kid. And that feels really, really good. Done it again. We've done it again. Exactly. When you have a crazy idea, and it goes really, really, really well. This is how it goes. We had a brilliant time. I can't imagine it was more fun for him than it was for me. One of the reasons why this swept people away is because Make-A-Wish, it's a very simple mission. Who can't get behind a child who has a life-threatening medical condition? And to try to give them hope, strength, and joy. Today, we employed thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, who got to participate in the power of a wish. And that energy at Civic Center was incredible. And that is a life transformation for not just Miles and his family, but for everyone who participated. And it a story like that inspires, but it also got people to act. There were over tens of thousands of people in San Francisco that truly came out for that amazing event because people want to feel good about things and get involved. There were also hundreds of thousands of people that had an emotional connection online. So stories can inspire. So why storytelling? Why is this important today more than ever before for your organization? 
Well, the first thing is that we live in an interconnected world. So you can't just push something over here. There are porous um, frames that information flows 24-7 around the globe instantly. You can't control it, but you can get part of it, become part of it, and get the momentum and the wind at your back. But there's other reasons, and this is not surprising to you. You have a lot of competition, and you want to raise money, you want to bring in volunteers, you want to bring in supporters, because you want to deliver on your missions. So you've got a lot of competition. So you need to find those stories that can bring people to you, like a magnet. The third thing is Generation C. Now, has anybody ever heard of Generation C? Ah, I've got something new for you. You've heard of Gen X, Gen Y, Boomers, etc. Generation C is a new generation. It's not about the age of this generation. It's about what we do because we constantly crave content. And we find content that we really like, we share it, we curate it. The interesting thing about Generation C is that while 65% of Generation C is under the age of 35, 35% is older. So this is not about age, it's about how we engage today. And then the last thing, and this is something that Edelman has been talking about for a long time. It's called the media cloverleaf. And the media cloverleaf is how information, so if you put out a press release, that's in the, um, you would send it to, for example, traditional media is a yellow one. And that might be print or broadcast or such. Or you might put it out on a social media channel. That's the lower one on the right. Or you might send it to hybrid media, Huffington Post or CSR Wire. Or, you, yeah, thank you, yes, my buddy's there. Or what we're talking about today is the blue part. And by the way, we, I'm going to make a little custom, like five or six slides from this. I'm going to give it to Mary, and then they can send it to you. So don't worry about this, because it'll look better when you get it. Okay? So your own content, you're a content creator. That's the blue one. And so what you want to do is you want to find a story. It needs to go into one of these clovers, but they amplify and they reverberate. Because what you want is in the middle, you see that little that little eyeglass, you want amplification, you want to get higher in search. So it's not just writing a press release, it's not just tweeting something, it's how these things work together. That's why when you have a great story, you get massive amplification. Okay, so there are four ways that I want to talk about in terms of how do you distinguish yourself. The first is create a powerful brand. And for those of you who don't know, I spent two years with some colleagues <laughs> writing this book. And everybody said, why don't you write a corporate book? I said, no, I'm going to write a not-for-profit book. This isn't about the identity, like the pretty mark. This is about how you build a focused and powerful brand. Because to tell your story, to get the right donors, supporters, and volunteers, and sponsors engage with you, you need to be really crisp with what you stand for. Because there's a really evil thing lurking in front of all not-for-profits, and it's called scope creep. Right? Well, this one's going to get, yeah, scope creep. Well, I started doing this, and now I'm doing that and doing that. Um, so this is how you do it. It's really, really simple. It's called the head, the hands, and the heart. The head is what do you do better than anybody else singularly focused, rational. The heart, it's not about you. It's about creating a very large umbrella and inviting people in. It's emotional. And then lastly, it's the hands. How do I engage? in many, many different ways. Let me show you a couple examples. UNICEF lost their way. It's a case in the book. They, what were they? Christmas cards, trick-or-treating. I have no clue. They went through this whole, whole introspection. They had some, actually some, some experts helping them from their board. And they said, what do we do better than anybody else? We save children's lives, especially in the developing world. We, and by the way, there's 26,000 children that die needlessly a day. This one that started this campaign. We want that to be zero. Believe in zero. And when they spoke with one voice, it was miraculous. Who came behind them? Who partnered with them? It was an amazing story. But you're saying, hey, for two point, I'm not UNICEF. I'm a smaller organization. So let me show you another case from the book, a, a case called Admission Control. Admission Control was a small group of individuals in Austin, Texas, and they basically said, we're going to take underserved kids, and we're going to teach them, we're going to mentor them, and get them into college. OK, admission control. So well, here's what happened. Somebody would call, and they'd answer the phone, admission control. 
I'm not calling NASA. Somebody hung up. I think I'm calling NASA. Their name wasn't what they did, and they had a very fuzzy brand. They went through their own very simple discussions, which is very helpful to do that introspection. And they said, what do we do better than anybody else? We get kids to go to college, and we forward them in their lives. College forward. Look at the numbers in the fundraising that when they had a crisp brand that they grew by. So this is something I think every single one in this room needs to do. You need to really focus on here and not let that little things on the side really pull you off of your focus. So now once you've got a strong brand, hey, let's get ready, set, and story tell. There's three types of stories that we really like. Your origin story about your founder, and I'm going to show you some examples of that. The people you serve. Talk about them, not you. If there's anything that you learn from this many, it's not about you. It's not like, well, we raise this many funds and we have this many volunteers. No, N-O. And not even like, well, one in five children are food compromised. I mean, hunger is really important, but don't talk the numbers. Talk the emotion. Talk the people. And last, who are your supporters? Who are your volunteers? Real people, real names. Grab them at the beginning. That's why you'll get these slides sent back to you. Um, be emotional, evoke anger, happiness, tension, and have, we like to have a happy ending. And so let's take a look at some of these examples. The first, how many of you know Donors Choose? How cool is Donors Choose? If, I'll tell you, um, Charles Best is the, he was a teacher. And in 2000, he was 25 years old and he was teaching in a very poor school. And he was sitting at lunch, like kind of, you know, having lunch, and he was talking to his colleagues, and he was totally amazed that they were at 11 o'clock at night going to Kinko's and, sorry, office, sorry, <laughs> office depot, <laughs> sorry. That was his story, not my story, okay, sorry. They were going to office depot, and they were <laughs> buying supplies um, on their own. Um, you know, they don't have a lot of money, and they were like, bring it to their classroom. And he said, you know, why can't I create a website, ask people to maybe donate some money? So $2,200, he created one of the first crowdsourcing fundraising sites. Fast forward to today, they have raised over $200 million. They've helped over 200,000 teachers. And he was on the cover of Fast Company, and I am so proud of this young man. The origin story. And he goes out there and he talks again and again to get people to join in. The stories we tell about each other matter very much. The stories we tell ourselves about our own lives matter. And most of all, I think the way that we participate in each other's stories is of deep importance. I was six years old when I first heard stories about the poor. Now, I didn't hear those stories from the poor themselves. I heard them from my Sunday school teacher and Jesus, kind of by my Sunday school teacher. I remember learning that people who were poor needed something material, food, clothing, shelter, that they didn't have. And I also was taught, coupled with that, that it was my job, this classroom full of you know, five and six-year-old children, it was our job, apparently, to help. This is what Jesus asked of us, and in that he said, what you do for the least of these, you do for me. Now, I was pretty psyched. I was very uh, eager to be useful in the world. I think we all have that feeling. And also, it was kind of interesting that God needed help. That was news to me, and it felt like it was a very important thing to get to participate in. But I also learned very soon thereafter that Jesus also said, and I'm paraphrasing, the poor would always be with us. This frustrated and confused me. I felt like I had been just given a homework assignment that I had to do, and I was excited to do, but no matter what I would do, I would fail. So I felt confused, a little bit frustrated and angry, like maybe I'd misunderstood something here, and, and I felt overwhelmed. And for the first time, I began to fear this group of people and to feel negative emotion towards a whole group of people. I imagined in my head a kind of long line of individuals that were never going away, that would always be with us. They were always going to ask me to help them and give them things, which I was excited to do, but I didn't know how it was going to work. And I didn't know what happened, what would happen when I ran out of things to give, <laughs> um, and especially if the problem was never going, going away. This idea that these new stories of business and of hope might be shared with my friends and family, and through that, maybe we could get some of the money that they needed um, to be able to continue their businesses and, as loans. That's, that's this little idea that turned into Kiva. A few months later, I went back to Uganda with a digital camera and a basic website that my partner, Matthew, and I had kind of built, and took pictures of seven of my new friends, 
posted their stories, these stories of entrepreneurship up on the website, spammed friends and family and said, we think this is legal, haven't heard back yet um, from the SEC on all the details, but what do you say? Do you wanna help participate in this, provide the money that they need? The money came in basically overnight, we sent it over to Uganda, and over the next six months, a beautiful thing happened. The entrepreneurs received the money, they were paid, and their businesses, in fact, grew. And they were able to support themselves and change the trajectory of their lives. This, how many of you are key, have donated to Kiva? Um, it's, it's amazing. They have a number, 98.94% of their little entrepreneurs give the money back. And most of them, by the way, no offense to the men in the room, are women. Um, it, it's an amazing story. She has raised through this system, because what happens is once I donate 25, I get it back, I give it back. So it goes again and again and again. $600 million in loans since 2005. It started out, again, I want to show you the origin story. She wasn't afraid to talk about Jesus. She was, and she's at TED. She's at the big TED. You know, you can be at a little TED or you can be at a Chamber of Commerce. You don't have to be at the big TED. Um, okay. <laughs> But you got to like to talk because you are, any of you that are founders of your NGO, if you have a really fascinating and interesting origin story, tell it. Okay. So now let's tell, talk about a compelling story. So the next one I want to talk about is the American Heart Association. And I've been working with them since, uh, for over 10 years now. And they did some research when we started working with them because the American Heart Association was about men and heart disease and big hearts and nothing emotional. And you know what we did is we wanted to make them emotional. So we did a piece of research to find out about women's relationship to health and such. Here's what we found out. And there's a nugget in here. Women put every single person in their lives ahead of their own mortality. Absolutely, everybody's going, yeah, absolutely. The husband, the son, the daughter, the cousin, the father, the mother, everything. So that was a germ of an idea. And so what I'm trying to instill in you is find those nuggets, those nuggets in your origin story, those nuggets in a beneficiary, nuggets in a supporter, and then tell a story around it. Now this, American Heart had a little bit of money. We went out and we found a celebrity, Elizabeth Banks, who had authentic celebrity, really important, had a relationship to heart disease. And then we told the story, and we hope you feel it's really compelling. It started out like a totally normal day. Mom! Okay, move objection deadline to the third line after survey. Oh, honey. For, for when you are, you always use the verb. That's the heart. What are you doing down there? Did you finish your breakfast? Ow. Whew. Don't hit your brother. <laughs> I mean, you have to eat something. Here. Okay, five minutes to carpool. Coffee. You okay, Mom? Oh, I'm fine. Sandwich orders. What do you want? Almond butter and jelly. Spaghetti. Oh, you sure you're okay? I'm fine, sweetie. I am so late. Hey, buddy, how you doing? Uh, hey, honey. Hmm. You okay? Uh, yeah, I'm fine. You sure? Oh, yeah. Here. Acai, my favorite. Yeah. See you guys later. Bye. Where are your shoes? Put your shoes back on, please. You know, go help your sister. We're going in three minutes. Oh my God, what am I doing? I forgot to cut off the crust. Voila, shoes on, potty if you need it. Honey, get your sister. Okay, get your shoes. Nobody move. I'm getting a dustpan. Oh, mom. I think you're having a heart attack. Honey, do I look like the type of person who has a heart attack? <laughs> I'm just gonna sit down. <sighs> I'm totally fine. Don't forget to wear the high socks with the shin guards. Forget about the shin guards, Mom. <gasps> Come on, Mrs. Onerdog is not gonna wait. Sorry to bother you. <laughs> I think I might be having a little heart attack. <laughs> Nothing really, just some nausea, tightening of the jaw, dizziness, shortness of breath, muscle pain, achiness, this terrible pressure in my chest. Oh, really? They can be here in how long? 
Two minutes. Can you make it ten? I thought I had gas. Turns out I was having a heart attack. Heart disease is the number one killer of American women. So now I take care of my heart and I tell the women in my life to do the same. Sounds great, by the way. That's nice, sweetie, but that's not my heart. That is. Make it your mission to save your life and the lives of the women you love. Find out more from the American Heart Association at GoRedForWomen.org. So you can see that that little data point, so think about with your organization, a little data point, an insight that then became a story, and then they told the story, but they told it with what? Humor. Because humor can be very, very memorable. Um, but they got their point across really, really well. Millions and millions of downloads. And what American Heart has accomplished is that women now have a much, that we have moved the behavior change and the knowledge significantly. So very, very exciting. So now let me show you another um, compelling story. And this is about a beneficiary. Um, this is a woman who has um, lung disease, lung cancer. And this is the kind of thing that you can do. Very simple, cleanly, not expensive. Her name is Susan. We all have this image of what lung cancer looks like. It's the 80-year-old man with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. And because my tumors are invisible and I look healthy, people don't think that I'm sick. I had an x-ray just for a common cough, and that was what had exposed a mass in my lung. Several tests and two weeks later, it was confirmed. I had stage four lung cancer, and I'd had it in my body for five to seven years and didn't even know it. I um, couldn't make sense of it because I had never smoked a day in my life, and I had always been healthy and strong, and um, I just, I didn't know that it could, you could get lung cancer from not smoking. I want the public to know what the statistics are and how severe of a diagnosis lung cancer is. And they certainly don't realize that it's killing more women every year than breast cancer and has since 1987. I want people to know that it can happen to them. It can happen to anyone. It happened to me and I certainly didn't think it would have ever happen to me. Well celebrated my 48th birthday and I don't want that to be my last and I don't want this last Christmas to be my last with my family and I just need people to start caring about this cause. Good news is Susan's doing really well. Um, but you can see it's very compelling. It's a little dicey to find somebody that will really tell their story, but you can simply tell it. It's very compelling. It's not the numbers that, lung, that American Lung's talking about. It's a person bringing the story to life. Okay. The next thing is about engagement. So how do you engage? How many of you are familiar with Movember? A lot. Um, Movember started with three guys in Australia talking to each other talking to each other going, you know what? We don't ever talk about men's health because men don't talk about their health. Um, prostate cancer, mental health, mental wellness, and things like that. So they said, you know, we're, we're not going to shave. And three became 10, became 20, became one country, became two country, became 21 countries 10 years later. And look at the amount of money they've raised. But they did it in a very compelling way. And here's what they started out with mustaches, but they, could, they let go control. This is about one of the things you can do. So the story here was men's health and how can we get men's, men engaged. They, what they allowed is a lot of people to do their own thing. They came up with a construct, they let it go, and people created their own videos, they created their own Instagram photos, they had Pinterest pages, et cetera, and it went around and around the globe. And I was amazed as someone in the communications and social issues and purpose space, when the Today Show, the entire month of November, you can't buy that. When all the guys, and it wasn't a mustache, it was like, we're not gonna shave. I mean, it was amazing, it was absolutely amazing. So again, 
It's not just about the story, but it's how the story engages. And certainly Bat Kid was another one. It wasn't just here's a story about a little boy who wants to be Bat Kid, but they thought really big. And they went to you know, the head of public relations from the city of San Francisco. And they said, this would be great for you. And they didn't take the first five no's. You know? And they, then they, got, they were very lucky to have um, the uh, social digital agency, the Clever Girls Collaborative, that helped them out. So engagement is really, really important. OK. So now there's some more best practices, and then we will close. So here's just some basic, basic tips, which is set goals. You know, you're sitting around. What's your goal? for your story. How do you want people to feel? Happy, sad? Do you want them to act? What do you want them to do? Identify your target audience, because your story will be geared towards them. Um, find story leads. And the way you find story leads, bring your colleagues together from different areas in your organization and say, let's maybe do a beneficiary story. Talk to me about somebody. Who have we helped out? And just search, search, search for those really compelling stories, like Susan, a great compelling story. Um, then you open with a hook. And I'm going to show you what a hook is in a moment. Um, overcome adversity. Solve a problem. Have a creative solution. But don't. These don'ts are really important. It's not just about the organization. Do not do that. Um, and don't give a list. Here's the things we do. That's our story. It's not your story. Um, and don't use the numbers. Talk about people and pe things happening to people. So again, I brought this slide back because I want to say again, focus on real people. Tell their names. Grab somebody at the beginning. Evoke emotions. So I want to talk to you a little bit about this one. There's a website called everydayheroes.com. It's a beautiful website because you know what? This isn't just about telling stories in video. It's about beautiful photos. So this website, by the way, it's about individuals telling their stories so they can fundraise. So there's a design here. So the website has the design. But I want to tell you the story about Emily and David, because words beautifully written tell stories. And here's the opening hook. Emily Gann and David Wolf were high school sweethearts. Got me. More than that, they were the kind of couple you rooted for. Got me some more. Madly in love, oh, now you got me, OK? And full of life, they couldn't wait to make plans for the future and thoroughly enjoy every second. But something really bad happened. David started having really, really bad headaches. And what they found was that at the very young age, he was about 23, he had a malignant brain tumor. And Emily was just beside herself. Um, after Dave was diagnosed, she said, he never let cancer define who he was. He always lived every day to the fullest. And Emily said, I'm going to, I got to do something. So she decided to, you know, run 10 miles and got some friends to give her money. She raised $500. And then she ran more miles. And then she got more friends involved, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. She was just, she did not want to let the disease describe and take over her life. And she loved David more than anybody else. Unfortunately, a year later, he died. And Emily often struggled with her decision to fundraise while Dave was experiencing cancer in real time, since it amplified the emotion she was experiencing tenfold. However, she found that the incredible outpouring of support often powered her through her darkest days. Emily said goodbye to David in April 2013. But she will never fully lose him and will never stop loving the man who inspired her to give her all. The written word, a photo, a love story, a tragedy, and somewhat of at least a melancholy happy ending. Don't forget the written word. Don't just get stuck on video. OK, photos. Um, I would be not a good leader for you or a presenter if I did not bring charity water to the table. Charity water is seen as one of the mo foremost marketers um, of branding in this space. Um, this is their Instagram page. They get really great photographers to go out into where they've got their recipients and their water projects, and they take beautiful, beautiful, beautiful photos. They have over 200,000 followers on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah.
I'm going to college. It's official. Real people, I want to make the point. Now, Target obviously is not a not-for-profit, but the point is that they give scholarships. And so how many of you could get some of your beneficiaries in a room with your iPhone and make a video and put some music behind it? That's why I wanted to show that to you. That, that's kind of grainy, but it's so, it's so visceral. It's so real. And so you can do that, and you can put that as your own content up on your website. You can make it shareable. You can put it on your Facebook page. So again, it doesn't have to be the quality of what you know, every little, you know, a little heart attack is. It can be that way. So again, I don't want you to think that this is over what you can do or that you can't pay for it, because that is like basically barely cost anything. Okay, the last story I want to show you is sometimes you got to be outrageous. The not-for-profit I'm going to show you is a little teeny tiny library in Troy, Michigan. And they had a big problem. Now, they had a great, they, a few people from the library got together and said, because the library is going to be closed. And they said, we have to come up with a solution. So I'm going to show you the solution. Now, this was done in kind of graphics. So that's a little bit of a sophisticated level. But I'm sure you might be able to do that if you got a really smart young person that just got out of like communication school to help you out, or an intern that wants something great in their portfolio. But take a look at this, because I want to give you, in my partying here, I want to give you the license to sometimes be outrageous because what do we know about Generation C? They want to share. They want to curate. So let's take a look. There once was a library, a beautiful, busy, award-winning library. Unfortunately, times were hard. The city of Troy, Michigan, no longer had enough money for its library, so it scheduled a vote asking the townspeople to approve a small tax increase. This angered an anti-tax group known as the Tea Party. Well-organized and well-funded, they started posting vote-no signs, mailing flyers, and making noise. They dominated the conversation, changing the topic from library, books, and reading to taxes, taxes, taxes. With no money and an election less than a month away, the library needed help. They needed something attention-getting, audacious, maybe even vile. So we decided to form a group of our own and started planting signs around town that said, vote to close the library August 2nd, book burning party August 5th. The idea of book burning is bad enough, but gleefully making it a party, well, that angered people enough to send them to our Facebook page. You people are sick. This is disgusting. Reject the wackos. Vote yes. But we didn't stop there. We created videos. Imagine this times 200,000. How cool is that? Posted on Twitter. The Troy Library might be short on money, but it has books to burn. Created items for sale. A book bag. How ironic. We placed newspaper ads, created check-ins, posted flyers, and lined up entertainment. You guys are booking a band? People became enraged. Why would you burn books, idiots? This is horrible. Cheap imbeciles. What the f*** is this world coming we to? We should burn your signs instead. Complete and total this idiots. Is really this is just down. Jerks. They posted their own links, shared with friends, debated the merits of libraries and the audacity of burning books. The conversation spread from Facebook to city council meetings, from newspapers to TV. It grew from local to national, even international news. Once it reached a fevered pitch, we revealed the true intent of our campaign. A vote against the library is like a vote to burn books. And people started posting, tweeting, and reporting all over again. In the end, we had changed the conversation completely, from taxes, 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 to library, library, library. And on August 2nd, the yes voters, voters who don't normally turn out to vote, turned out at levels 342% greater than projected. And the library won by a landslide. The town's library, its beautiful, award-winning library, had been saved. Not every story at the library has a happy ending. Fortunately, 
this one did. So, again, I put all of this together for you because I expect, okay, because I put, I put my hard time on on this, that I want you to take one or two little nuggets away from this today and, of course, all your conversations. You all have great stories to tell. So you got to start with what? Your core brand. It has to be sharp. It has to be focused. You can't tell the stories on the edge. Tell the stories that reflect the center of your brand. Then you tell them with what? Real people, emotions. You can try and grab them from the beginning. You can be outrageous. That is so outrageous. Book burning. But think about it. And that wasn't created by an agency. That was created by a few people getting together with one month to go with no money. And the power of social media and a great idea. So you all can do it. And um, I'm thrilled that I got the chance to be here and to help my good friend Mary. And go to that, find that in focus, which is online, and we'll send you a little bit of these slides and such so they can help you out. And you have a great symposium. So thank you very much.